have a, a very specific... Is that basically you're saying to the world, you're saying there is this place called Central Asia. I studied Uzbek very hard and exactly right, okay. exactly right. They invented this trade network and different religions were still there. Right now in Uzbek some people talk about this quite seriously. They were bring, they were spreading Central Asian culture. And, thinking. and open the windows in every direction, yeah. Mr. Merzioyev's formula. And I said that in Central Asia you have to play by certain rules. Stimulated the mind. He lost his Krisha, he, he lost his amazing <laughs> sign of success if you're being criticized from both sides. Hi everyone, uh, this is Hoshim of Economics and I'm Berzat. Uh, our guest today is Frederick Starr. Uh, Professor Starr is a uh, I would say the most important figure in Central Asian studies right now in the United States. And uh, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. Uh, I'll start right away. Uh, I guess my first question would be about your book, the book that you recently published, uh, Lost Enlightenment. Uh, I read your book be before uh, we met. and In English or in Uzbek? English, in English. In English. Uh -huh. uh, I actually didn't know that there is an Uzbek translation. I found a Kazakh one, uh, and I just you know like recently learned that it is actually translated to Uzbek. As a historian, as somebody who did not study Central Asian uh, you know region in grad school or, or even before, but you came to this idea pretty late. Uh, you said uh, in '96 or something you started to think about it. Uh, how did you study the region? Like, how did you start studying? How, how does it happen that you can study a region that is so complicated in terms of religion, in terms of geography, in terms of economics? I have to go back to early biography. I started my career in archaeology, and I worked for several years in, in uh, doing archaeological work in Turkey, mapping ancient roads. And, and that, at a certain point, uh, I was working down on the Turkish-Syrian uh, border. It became rather dangerous, and I decided it wasn't really good for my health. I was traveling all over the place, you know, in a little jeep and talking to all the old men at Village Well, Vill Village Springs, and uh, I decided at that point, um, because the Soviet Union was a big presence in our life in the West, uh, to shift toward toward Russian and Soviet studies, when the, and did that and started the Kennan Institute here in town, which is still thriving. Uh, but then, uh, after the collapse of the USSR, I realized that there were th new countries that we had to know about, and we didn't know about them. And the reason we didn't know is that, frankly, Books, for example, published in Uzbekistan didn't get to the United States, didn't get abroad because they all only went, only the books that Moscow wanted got abroad. Um, and this was, this was true in other fields too. So I realized after the collapse of the USSR that we needed to really learn about a lot of regions, new countries that we hadn't studied closely. And, and that's when I decided to establish the Central Asia Caucasus Institute here in Washington, which and that was 25 years ago, and it's thriving today. So I, because of my Turkish background, I, I was able to read with uh, fairly easily to read my way into Uzbek and to, and to, and to and I traveled everywhere. And then I got involved in, I got involved in, in, in planning some universities in the region, and I yeah. serve on the, as a trustee of two of them today. Uh, but in that process, I had to go everywhere. Just mechanically, like how do you think about learning a new culture or, 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 or new studies? Like how you just do, you do it. <laughs> uh, but but to put it like more... What, what's, your, what's your algorithm? Let's say I, 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 yes. I, I'm a student of some area. Let's, let's put it Central Asia. I'm, I'm American, yes. let's say. Yes. And I want to study Central Asia. I've never been there. You know, I was born in Vermont yes. or something. And I want to study it. Like, how would you tell me how to study? Well, I would say, first of all, uh, go there. Okay. Unless you have a, a very specific, concrete 
knowledge of the place. And not just the capital. Travel around, take your time, take months. And, and uh, you know, I've traveled all over Central Asia and Afghanistan too. And, and, and this is, you must be there, that's first. Second, you, you must have access to languages. Uh, you, you must, uh, uh, I, I studied Uzbek very hard and, and unless I've had a, a, a fairly generous amount of, of Uzbek vodka today, I don't speak it Quite. publicly. <laughs> I mean, it's, I'm afraid I've allowed it to uh, decay a bit, but, but I did study it hard and, and uh, languages are important. I had Russian, I, uh, my wife is German, so I, I, ha I had access to information from a lot of different sources. But the main thing I think is two things, language and being there. Let's say I go there. Yes. And then I want to study the history of the land that was 1,000 years ago, like you did for your book, yes. right? So uh, people who live there right now don't speak the language, probably are in a different period, like historically. It's just like going to a place where it's not like a descendant, like you can't really name this guy being grand grandson of Al Khwarazmi, right? I mean, it's just, it may be a different group of people. You know, there was a Mongolian invasion, there was. A lot of things that happened at that time, but like, you know... They're not the same people. They may or may not be. I, I'm not yeah. a historian to yeah. make that claim, but what I'm trying to say is that uh, in terms of like, let's say, there are civilizations in this world, and, we, and that right now there are countries there, but those civilizations, the countries that are there, or national countries, or even ethnicities or languages, are, are absolutely orthogonal to the people who lived there before. So in, in that sense, how, how do you do it? Like, most of your sources are Persian. They're not Uzbek. Like, why do you study Uzbek? Well, they're Persianate, okay, and yep. and uh, uh, um, uh, not, uh, but many are Turkic too. I, I know, like Khosrowi or or, or yeah, something like that, like probably Farabi or something. Yeah, but uh, Farabi was probably Persianate, Persianate. yeah, okay, almost yeah. certainly. How, however, you have um, uh, Mahmud of uh, uh, Kashgar, you have uh, uh, Yusuf of Balasagun. Those, those were Turkic, okay, big figures. Um, but, but it's very interesting. There is one group in Central Asia today who are lineal descendants from an ancient group, and that's the, the Yak in Yaknob, in, in Tajikistan's very high valley, uh -huh. uh, where they are the li lineal descendants of the ancient Sogdians from the Zarashan like, Valley. Oh, Imagine. Not, not Bactrians? No, 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 okay. Sogdians. And, and they even have preserved parts of the, fragments of the Sogdian language. But you're right. Yeah. You're right. I'm not These sure aren't the helpful. same. Yeah. And it's a long distance. But on the other hand, getting a tactile sense of the f geography is very important. It's very important to understand, for example, uh, uh, take Samarkand. Okay. Samarkand, we, we think of Tourists go boom, they go right Registar. to, they, they, there mm -hmm. they are, uh, you know, Bibi Hanum and so on. They don't realize that it was a whole big oasis, that there were many towns within this oasis. There were walls around this oasis. This was a micro civilization right there. And the same was true, of course, in Bukhara or Merv or Balkh or whatever. The, and just to appreciate that these were complex centers with all kinds of industries and activities, just to, to see that on the ground today and to appreciate that it's not just that little city that you're talking about. I agree with you that probably going there might help on margins in terms of studying. But generally, uh, when you're trying to read sources, and probably you read sources that are mostly written in Arabic, because most of the people that you wrote about published their scholar work in, in Arabic, and some, even Mahmoud of Qajar, right? He wrote uh, a, 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 essentially a dictionary mm -hmm. of Turkic language to Arabic. Yeah. Uh, there might be reasons why he wrote it. Like in your book, you, you yes. argue about it. But again, his main audience was somewhere in Baghdad or somewhere, somewhere however, in the Middle East. However, right? however. Uh, you have to 
have to keep in mind that, that there's been 100 years of really serious scholarship. Uh, this isn't scholarship that average person learns about. This is taking, these are the real hardcore scholars. For example, uh, you mentioned uh, Mahmoud of Kashgar. <clears throat> there, it, there was a man, an American, who lived, uh, who worked at the University of Chicago for many years, who did a unbelievable edition of Kashgari's book uh, about the Turkic languages. Yeah, this, this, he analyzed every aspect of it. He did a beautiful translation into English. There are translations into German, into Russian, all, French. All these, the, a century of scholarship was at my disposal. Okay. Uh, so let us talk about the book, not the process. Yes. Now, right? So uh, I read your book probably as an average and layperson reader. So I'm not a historian, and I probably am not very familiar with the methods that historians use. Two things I noticed about the book is like it, 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 it reads as a narration. It reads like a story. Like you, saw, you start with the you know, correspondence of two people and then how this changed. But the main message of the book that I understood, which I may be wrong, and I really want you to talk me out if I'm wrong, if I'm not wrong, I want you to say, is that basically you're saying to the world, you're saying there is this place called Central Asia, which we now probably regard as a backwater of the world. Like nothing really important happens there, uh, as far as you know, the world is concerned. And probably nothing very important happened there too, like what the world thinks, because now nothing is happening. But you're saying, you know, th there, there was a pl time between you know eighth and twelfth century or thirteenth, whatever you know people use, in which this place was probably the the most important uh, place in the world map in terms of intellectual production, and not only intellectual but general. It was mm -hmm. a place to be. It was like a New York of its time or something. I'm Absolutely. not sure New York is New York now, but so th this was your message. And then in the book you said, but for some reason, which I'll tell what the reason is that I understood they lost it now. And to understand them, you're saying, we have to understand that golden age. Am I right or wrong? Exactly right. Okay. Exactly right. Okay. And by the way, yeah. writing this book, I was not interested. I wanted it to be read by the top scholars, but I also wanted it to be read by people exactly like you. Educa like? Highly educated people in many different fields. Okay. Uh, let me take my economist hat and ask you this question. In economics, like you, you historians don't like us because you call it determinism, right? Like we always think about uh, events in terms of what was a reason behind it, but not mm -hmm. necessarily a person behind yes. it. Yes. So deterministically, I want to ask you first question, like why Central Asia? In your book, you try to make a case that it was trade, it was trading routes, there was like a lot of things going on. They were close to China, close to India, close to Middle East, and they were in the middle of this melting pot, if you the will. The only ones in the middle. But, 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 but hear me out. Uh, why it didn't happen in, in the Middle East? Meaning, Middle East could use Central Asia, they could use China, they could use India. Like, why, what was special about Middle East? Because they were basically the same country politically, right? Not really. But, I mean, it was like almost like a one, like from from, I don't know, from Western Xinjiang to like, like almost all Khorasan was, was one. And then, you know, yeah. Baghdad was uh, very close to it in terms of, again, politics. But why, you know, it didn't happen in, in, in Syria or... or, I, or I, took a, I take a very economist approach to this issue. Okay. First of all, these were rich and successful because of trade and because of manufacturing. We, we, we've, we're, these were not passive traders. They were actually producing huge amounts of goods that were being exported in every direction. We forget that. We, we forget that they invented this trade network that wasn't done by the Chinese or the Europeans or the Arabs or the Indians. But, but again, why the trade, ha like, you're saying it's because a is not a location good. really is important, okay. and and un the, the Arabs didn't do this because they they had their brief flowering, but but it wasn't it didn't attain the high level 
that uh, was achieved in Central Asia and it wasn't sustained. Why? Because I think the interaction between open-minded contact with the world and the economic contact is very important. For example, you know, Central Asian, I mean, deep underneath the soil is a layer of Zoroastrianism, which was invented there, <laughs> created there as a, as a kind of the archetypal religion. religion yeah. uh, then Buddhism and, and the Greek gods and, 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 all, and Judaism and Christianity and many flavors of Islam. This was a very rich, complex place. And the, the very complexity, all these threads feeding in, stimulated the mind. And I th that is something that is as so, important as the economics. How much in this equation was importance of Arabs' conquest of Central Asia? Meaning most of it happened after Central Asia became both under caliphate and, and became Muslim. So most of the people were second or third generation converts. Uh, and were many, weren't, many weren't Muslims. Uh, probably not. And, and, and not and openly Muslim. You, you, you are arguing in the book that some of them were very de devout Muslims and some of them were probably more like, uh, I, I wouldn't call it liberal, but let's, let's put it this way. Like, yeah. like liberal Muslims, those who did it f not for, for religion, but for pecuniary but benefits. Let, let me it. add, let me take it from the other side. Okay. The Arabs destroyed much culture in Central Asia. Yeah. Harezm, for example, yeah. had its own language, its yeah. own literature, its own books, gone. Yeah. Uh, and this is true for, I mean, Zora, the texts of Zoroastrianism, gone. Uh, and I, I, think, I think what they did bring was, was a common language, which is very important, playing the role of Latin in the West. That was very important. Um, but I, I think you underestimate how much was there before. If I were to write a criticism of my book, yeah. I would say you should have started much earlier and e explained the riches intellectually and culturally and economically pre uh, this golden age. No, uh, so let me take that sense and say, yeah. all right, most of whatever happened in the Golden Age was not due to the conquest of Arabs or Islam, but it was before that. Because of the, the do, rich do, do, heritage, you to that yes. statement? because of the rich so heritage. If, if that's true, why didn't it happen before Arabs' conquest? Meaning, why Central Asia didn't have their Golden Age from 3rd century to 6th, but they had, like, you know, right after they, they were part of the Caliphate? Like, uh, again, I, I, I have to remind you that all the r great r writers of Central Asia, none of them are known to us except through maybe 10% of what they wrote. The rest is gone, lost. Now, pre before this golden age about which I wrote, there were also important writers. We don't know them. Their, their works have disappeared. Uh, 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 I, I touch on a few that we know have fragments of, but, okay. but the loss, the cultural destruction that occurred is very important. And, and this did not come out of a, a barren soil. This came out of a rich and deep culture, which my dear friend, uh, Mr. Atveladze, has devoted his life to studying the pre-Muslim era. Now, what happened in the Muslim era is that th these were very open-minded and tolerant people. And, and there were people who, as you say, were very pious. There were people who were less pious. There were people who were completely secular. And there were people who were anti-religion. They all were there, and they were all interacting. And different religions were still there. Don't I mean, forget. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with you in terms of like them being tolerant about religions. What I was trying to, to get you at was more like to grapple with these two questions. First is that 
why they were flourishing because they were part of the, this like larger empire? Was it was it the reason? No, of, I think the larger trade? empire was flourishing be, as much because of them. No, uh, and and don't forget yeah. they took over. The Abbasid Empire After was after Harun al Rashid's death, right? Yes, they so, took like, his over. Son they lived in Merv, and then they yes, moved. exactly. The very, people don't point this out. They never point this out. They think of Baghdad as is is solely a Middle Eastern and Arab phenomenon. It wasn't. So, I want you uh, really to to tell me or to explain to me this thing. So, Central Asia was part of the Abbasids, and. I would assume, again, as an economist, not as a historian, that because they were part of the Abbasid Empire and because trade routes were protected by, say, the government that was in Baghdad at that time, and then basically area from like West China till, till um, you know, Lebanon or, or something like that were almost like one country. So trade, there was low tariffs and so on and so forth. And therefore, being in a part of like a bigger economy, those people could scale their businesses, you know, their their goods were were sold in Damascus and Baghdad and, and anywhere they want. But if it wasn't for an Arab conquest, like the question again is, why it didn't happen before Arab conquest? And my uh, my opinion was maybe because it wasn't a part of the larger empire. Well, let me agree with you uh, partly that certainly this was a factor, as was the fact that they were so close to India so close and accessible to China. India is, I mean, look on the map. Uh, uh, India, would, uh, Lahore, a great, great capital, uh, is, is, is really par almost culturally part of Central Asia. So, but your, your point is right. The Abbasids did help, but who protected those trade routes? It was the Turkic, Turkic yeah. guys in the countryside. I and those know. were done because they had a reciprocal arrangement, not with Baghdad, but with these great urban centers. They were mutually dependent. The, the Turkic nomads were manufacturing. They were producing all kinds of goods in addition to horses. <laughs> they okay. were producing masses of goods, which they sold in the great urban centers. The urban centers found a market in the, in, among the nomads and the Turks. So this didn't require, and it didn't ever get, uh, trade support from, from, the, from Baghdad, from the Abbasids. Even the currency. When the Abbasids produced their currency, the, lo the locals in Central Asia produced their own, or they changed it so that their stamp was on it. Yeah, but I mean, all the currencies were gold, so we, we didn't have a fiat currency at that time. But, but uh, I, I guess my question is like, why it didn't happen in Baghdad? So, well, if, you know, if, if mean, all the recipes are, are in there, but like... But, but my, what I'm suggesting here is that Baghdad itself, which was designed and constructed largely by people from Central, Central Asia, Asia, and then with the, the Abbasid rule was totally dependent on Central Asian Turks. The entire military was. And, and they were completely. And how many of these great intellectual figures whom we say, oh, he was, you know, Farabi, Harazmi, all, the, all these people. Well, of course, they may have been in Baghdad for a while, but they were all, re they, were bring they were spreading Central Asian culture, just as later they spread it to China and certainly spread it to India. There is still to this day, there are uh, Ibn Sina hospitals in India that, that depend on his tradition of medicine. So, so they, I'm, what I'm suggesting is that the dynamic element in, in the Eurasia at that period for several hundred years came from this very fertile intellectually, economically fertile region of Central Asia. And the, what we think of as the center further to the west wasn't. Okay, um, let's say I buy this. One question I want to ask is like, why did you call it lost enlightenment but lo not lost, say, I don't know, renaissance? I think there was much more deep continuity 
in cultural intellectual continuity in Central Asia than we have yet recognized. Give you an example. I would love to read a book that examines how traditions of Buddhism ended up appearing in a new renaissance, if you will, in Sufism. Um, go to Termez, the two were, the two were like this. Uh, um, I, I think there was more continuity than we realized. So that's why the name Renaissance wouldn't do the justice So it's not, fact, Renaissance yeah. implies that something like, died yeah, and came exactly. back. No, but what I'm saying in terms of the world map of intellectualism, right? So the, the cradle was probably somewhere in the Middle East, then it went to Greek towns and, you know, cities, I would say, uh, then, you know, like Plato and Aristotle. And afterwards, pretty much the world was, you know, silent in terms of science and basically books that Horesmi or Avicenna read were uh, Greek uh, philosophy, Greek logic and... and, and Greek you know, science. Greek science, basically. And yeah. how did they know them? Because um, Arabs brought it. Because Syrian Christians, Arabs, they're ethnically Arabs, yeah, but yeah. they're Syrian Christians who happen to know both Greek and Arabic. It was, a, and and they why why were they bringing this knowledge to Central Asia? Because they were all over Central Asia. They were very active all the way down to India, by the way. To this day, there are Syrian Christians so, so, in India. So Syrian Christians basically lived in the uh, Eastern Byzantine Empire, right? Like no, they lived in they lived in every city in Central Asia. No, too. I'm saying like how they came from Syria ah, to yes. Central Asia because they were part of sure, you know, sure. Eastern Eastern exactly. Roman yes. Empire, and then when exactly. Arabs came, they it was part of one big country. That's why they were able to move freely, you know, relatively freely within one country, and then. They brought the works, and Central Asian scholars were able to read them. I in don't Arabic. think you, that the Abbasid rule was a country in the sense that you use the term oh, okay. and repeatedly use the okay. term. So how should I how should I uh, use it? I think it was a method of collecting taxes isn't and it, and it spending the definition them of the republic and spending them on an army to fight external enemies. But. I mean, as we know, a country or, or a state usually defined as a place where you have, you know, postal services and an army, right? I mean, what's what's the second thing that, that was missing from Abbasid Empire that you think that doesn't make I, them a country? I think my impression is that it was a relatively thin, and all empires were relatively thin uh, compared with what we think of today, and by comparison, these, if you will, city-states of Central Asia, these great oasis-based centers, uh, were r relatively much more important than we think today. We, they didn't, this hasn't been studied adequately. There is, there is a lot of evidence on this, but these cities, whether it's Bukhara, Samarkand, Merv, Balkh, you name it, uh, and, and, and 50 others, these these were very sophisticated places that had that had ec federalism? solid economic base, like federalism. Like they were. It's a kind of. It's a kind of. Yes, they they had to have. My prosperity depends on good relations with you, my neighbor. Maybe it's it's three days away, but therefore there were understandings that developed which haven't been studied. There was, a, I, I like your term, federalism, but it wasn't formalized that way. No, I mean like if you look at the US history too, by like 19th century for example, like federal taxes were less than like 5% of the GDP of the United States. Yes, well, it means like decentralized. Very decentralized. So they were partly like that, like so maybe 2 or 3% of the, of the economy were you know collected by taxes but the rest were were pretty much federalized. And, and I, I, I think your point is, is I, like, I like the term federalized, but like divided the, into, the rule into better. Of, of this great Central Asian culture was highly, didn't require a big boss. There yeah. were big bosses like Mahmoud of Ghazni who yeah, yeah, yeah. appeared, but they didn't help. 
particularly. Okay. Um, it didn't require them because there were so many practical understandings between the leaders, business leaders, and others of the and and political leaders of these great urban centers. So basically the recipe is the following. If you have free trade, low tariffs, um, more or less adequate level of security, and more or less tolerance to the way people believe and open-mindedness towards and, towards thinking. And open the windows in every direction. Yeah, then you probably will get innovation. This innovation sounds like Mr. Mirzioyev's formula. Uh, uh, let, me, let me think about <laughs> it as innovations that like, uh, uh, yeah. as we know it currently. So the current centers of the innovations in the world are probably like Silicon Valley. Uh, there are places that are struggling with it. Uh, I mean, you know, probably the second best place is probably somewhere around Tel Aviv in, in Israel. Uh, other places in the world more or less are doing it, but you know they're way behind. You know, modern Silicon Valley, and people really try to study what's going on. And the current literature of innovations and uh, innovation and you know technology tells us that clusters or like big cities are really important. So there's a uh, Harvard economist Edward Glazer, Glazer, I guess I don't know. He has Glazer, a book yeah. on called uh, Triumph yeah. of the City, but more or less he has a lot of work on clusters and and how how one industry or one type of pursuit will help, will help others. And if we measure by that margin, Central Asia is basically not doing that. It was pretty autarkic. Like if you look at average tariff size in Uzbekistan, it's probably very high because it's not part of We're the We're in modern Central Asia now. Modern Central Asia, yes. yeah. Autarkic, absolutely. Yeah, very autarkic. But then it was autarkic not only in 96, in 1996. It was pretty autarkic in 1596 too. So like... In 1596, yeah, but yeah. not 1096. Not 1096. So what, 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 I guess why I'm, why I'm trying to tell you this is to hear the following story. In your book, you basically say a name of the person who basically was responsible for the demise of that. And I find it not very adequate of an explanation for people like me in terms of saying, oh... Uh, we'll talk about him later, uh, like in a minute, but like I'm saying, if the recipe of growth is the following, trade, openness, and so on and so forth, why the recipe of the demise is not doing the opposite? So meaning, uh, they were pretty open when they started the climb. And you argue very fervently, I would say, that it wasn't Mongol invasion that made them, made them go down. They were pretty weak already when Mongols came in. I think you're... Absolutely right to to emphasize to distinguish between different kinds of decline okay. and different kinds of flowering. Uh, intellectual flowering can have various types of its own. There is that which is focused on on science, ma mathematic, abstract thinking. That which is focused on art and, and co other forms of culture. Then on the other side, you have the economic prosperity. You, there are, the world is full today of, of areas that are extremely prosperous economically. And it linked, integrated, you name it, but which are not producing significant intellectual products. So uh, wait, you're saying there are places in the world that are rich, but they're not producing technology, in the new technology? I mean, I mean, intellectual production in several such centers is far less than the level of the economy would. Can you give an example? I think this is, uh, this is true in, in, in large parts of the Gulf, for example. Uh, oh. Super, super rich. Oh, uh, I get it, I get it. But yeah, and, and, and most of the wealth not, comes from the oil. not the only one. Hmm? I mean, they are, most of their wealth comes from, from the oil, right? Yeah, but. Other than that, most of the wealth in the world but is But I great. think, look, there are very few moments in, in civilization where economic prosperity and intellectual prosperity coincide. The Roman, Roman Empire produced extraordinary achievements in many areas, especially law, by the way. 
but it did not produce scientific achievements on the level of what the Greeks had done. The Greeks were so uh, far ahead no, of that. I, I would argue, yes. like, I, I think Greeks are scientists and Romans are engineers. I mean, in terms of like civil engineering, and in terms of roads, and in terms of water, in terms of a lot of things that makes people's life better, Romans did a tremendous they job. They did, absolutely. Yeah. But it, it wasn't, it was not uh, the same type of intellectual flowering that, we're, that w is our focus here. Okay. Um, L let me Abstract buy Abstract thinking. I get it. You are saying basically if you can produce treaties of logic or trigonometry or mathematics or, or chemistry or thinking about philosophy of science or whatever, this is very important. And Central Asians actually th thrived in that, like the, the poetry, everything. So I want to hear your short version of why the decline happened. I mean, I read your book, obviously, and I know what you say, but like, maybe I didn't get it. Like, let me hear, let me hear what you think. Well, first of all, I agree with you entirely. The economic decline uh, actually was, was, was slower. And, yes. and unquestionably, unquestionably, the hit from the Mongols affected that, although to an amazing degree they did recover uh, economically, um, uh, but not in the same degree of dynamism. Yeah. Um, I would say that the, that the decline, first of all, we don't need to explain it because they were being intellectually highly productive for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So you know, not, nothing lasts forever. So, uh, so let's, not, let's not start blaming them. But I think the biggest reason was that the conflict between Sunni and Shia Muslims created an environment of, uh, in which, of intellectual combat. And this kind of abstract thinking, which produced such phenomenal results in Central Asia, came under attack. And because, it, well, I, I, of course, speak of specific uh, uh, writers and thinkers, um, and but but I think the bigger part is that the conflict of of Sunni and Shia, which was reflected in the conflict between Sunni Baghdad and Shia Cairo, uh, the, the, these two competing competing caliphates. Khorasan was almost homogeneously Sunni, right? Yes. So why, why is it a conflict that but, made but it decline? But the conflict meant that, that um, the, on the Sunni side, they were saying this speculative stuff is irrelevant and, and, and not germane to the most important issues of life. The, their argument was a very fundamentalist one, namely that all life's questions can be solved, uh, resolved by texts from the Holy Quran and from the Hadiths. So you're telling the Al-Ghazali's argument. The, and uh, uh, he eventually came to that. Now, various people have asked me, uh, why are you so hostile to Ghazali? And I'm not. Because later on in his life, after this episode in, as a younger man uh, in Baghdad, he, he lost his krisha, he, he lost his political protection. So you know, like, you know, you know important words in Central Asia, krisha, right? <laughs> he lost his krisha, he yeah, really yeah, did. Yeah. And, and then he fo focused on faith and what... Ghazali wrote about faith is important for all religions, it highly respected in the Christian and Jewish worlds as well. But early along, he did terrible things, and that is he, ra he frontally attacked all of the kind of learning uh, that uh, I'm... And so here I kind of disagree, and I kind of did some uh, homework on that, right? So, so there is this book that he basically, I think it's called Tahallutuf al falsifa So meaning the, essentially the problems of, or, or like troubles, or refutation of the philosophers. 
Before that, he had a book called uh, Maqsad al falsifa So in that book that, that Ghazali wrote, he talks basically about Avicennian logic. The logic, so Avicenna, or even Sina, as commonly known to our probably listeners, uh, was very Aristotelian in, in his logic, right? Was very... And suspected of being very Shia. Let me put it this way. Free intellectual inquiry got caught between, in the conflict between two caliphates, one of which happened to be Sunni, the other happened to be Shia. And oh, this was the, okay. and, and got caught in between. Ghazali's role was to be the voice of one of these at a key, key moment. Now, interestingly, interestingly, I mean, uh, the, the relative moderation of a lot of Central Asian thought, which, you know, the Hanafi tradition and so on, it's relatively yeah. more moderate, um, uh, would have allowed this to continue. But eventually, though, uh, the development which you rightly have under, underscored, namely the eventual waning of, this, of the, these great land routes to, to the east, uh, this knocked the, uh, the f economic base out from under it. And so, and, but, but uh, I want to repeat what I <laughs> said earlier. We're, we're talking about this as if we're mourning someone who died early, died too young. But in fact, this, this flowering that I wrote about did last for hundreds of years and in a bit of criticism of my own work, had we more documents, we could probably trace it earlier too. So let's not let's not I see, worry okay. about blaming the causes. But, but, okay, I, well, let's say I buy it. But like you know, I, I think a lot of things that are uh, well grounded are, are are fairly you know sustainable. You know, I would say this was sustained for f few hundred years. years. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's sure. amazing. Um, so let, let us speak a little bit about Fred Starr, a professor, right? Like how how'd you came about this? So I looked through your you know biography and you you did a history at Princeton and then you studied classics, uh, Latin and Greek. Uh, oh wow, okay, the, the, this part I didn't know, but you wrote a book on uh, this is decentralization in in Russia in 19th century. So basically before. Uh, Alexander II, right? So uh, under Alexander, well, uh, yeah, be just before Alexander II. So yeah. it's like Nick. Uh, well, it not under Nicholas. It really flourished under Alexander. Alexander II. Yeah. So, so, but before the um, uh, the cancellation of this uh, law, it's keep us not crowded. Before right? Alexander the yeah. Third. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and then, so you wrote about this, which is an important topic. You know, th there was like after Napoleonic Wars in Russia, and, and yada yada. Uh, like, why, why, do you th why did you think about this at all? Like, what, what Very was simple. I, I, my life has been lived, above all, in the Midwest and the South. Not on the East Coast, not on the West Coast. So you're not from coastal elites. And, <laughs> we, and we, well, whether elite or non-elite, or self-designated elites, yeah. I think is a better term, by the way. But yeah. because of this, I never expected look to Washington for solutions to life's problems. Uh, we never just didn't think this way, you know. The, the decentralization is the very core of our Constitution, it seems to me, uh, and giving so much authority to the states and so forth, and, and that local solutions are always better than things invented far away. I therefore was curious, you know, everyone said, well, the Russian tradition is a, of czarist centralization. I said, well, is there another tradition there? It turns out, yes, there was. And that's what I wrote about. Okay. But, I mean, Russia isn't a natural place of decentralization. It's probably one of the most centralized, you know, regimes in the last 
600 years, I guess. Like, it's, it's really hard to find a place that was as centralized as Russia. And by the way, I'm not saying, you know, Soviet Union. I'm not saying current Russian Federation. I'm talking about... The whole thing. The whole thing. Yeah, from, I, from, I'm with from, you. From, 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 like, Mongols. I'm not arguing. And then, like, isn't it very curious to study the, the centralization of the country? But it was a very important strand in their thinking. Their whole legal thought in the 19th century went in this direction. Okay. Uh, I even the, the, the people whom... Uh, Mr. Gorbachev studied in law school. They, th this is the song they were singing. So okay. it's there, but under the surface. So what, uh, so what do you think of, uh, of a new deal and then you know, increase of you know, federal government? I think, uh, I, I think we have much too much federal government today. I think Washington should... Uh, no, should but like be new deal, like, like Roosevelt. Well, but that started then, and, and I think we, we've gone too far in the direction of centralization. Too much bureaucracy, too much Washington. We need m more, more local rule. What? And by the way, this takes us back to what Central we were Asia. discussing yeah. in Central Asia. I, 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 even though there was not a big governmental structure, these city states, uh, they're not quite city states, we need a better term, but they managed to solve the most important economic and uh, uh, political problems and security problems. What do you think of government investment in finance, uh, sorry, n not in finance, but like government, finan government financing innovations in technology? Like is it important? Oh, I, I, think, I think it is, it is important. And, and I mean, uh, after all, governments control currency. Uh, they, 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 they have a, a fundamental role in, in all key financial tri transactions. That goes without saying no, in the I'm modern like world. What do you think of government financing the innovation scientists? I, 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 it's been very positive, okay. but on the other hand, it's not the sole source of innovation. Okay. Of, 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 uh, it shouldn't be the sole source of support or innovation. So let's talk about 20... Because governments are subject to their own politics. So um, le let me talk a little brief, I guess, about 20th century architecture of the Soviet Union. You wrote a book on that. W what's up with it? Like, how, like uh, what, what, what fascinates me was that the, 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 the how orthogonal the topics that you write about, like the centralization in Russia before Alexander III, then Soviet architecture, then Soviet jazz, and then you know centralization in in 11th century. Like, how do you think what? about? My interest in, in architecture has other sources, but I was intrigued by the fact that in the 1920s and early 30s, there existed in the Soviet Union a very innovative current in architecture. Uh, and it was usually thought to have come from so-called constructivist group who ideologically were way over on, close, to, close to the communists. Uh, there was also a, another group led by Konstantin Stepanich Melnikov, a great innovator whose home is now a museum in Moscow. They finally embraced him after uh, persecuting him throughout his entire life. But this other group was the same kind of free-thinking, imaginative, mixing of, of, of philosophy and architecture, which I found later in s among the Central Asian thinkers. Okay, yeah, interesting. So it's like a polymath thing. And, and another, yes, and another develop aspect of it is important, and that is that I was interested both in the architecture and in jazz uh, uh, with currents in Soviet life that existed in spite of rather than because of the state. Okay. And and I, I it's not a book about j it, it, very much a book about jazz, but but it's really about the inability of the highly centralized, ruthless Soviet state to control people's values and people's taste. Okay, let's talk about modern Russia. You have this report on Putin's grand strategy in Central Asia and Eurasia more generally, yeah. and Eurasian Union. Right now in Uzbek, some people talk about this quite seriously. Right, they are basically discussing that. And in your report uh, that you wrote, I think, with your institute, uh, you basically s are not very positive about that. Can you can you elaborate? Well, I look. 
if the idea is to create a, a real uh, trade zone like the EU, it's failed because tr trade within the region reached a peak in 2012 and it's never <laughs> come back to it. Mo it's just the Eurasian Economic Union looks to, I think, any fair-minded observer as a, as a kind of Trojan horse for Russia to e export its goods to a protected market. So it's like USSR 2.0? Well, it has, a, I mean, statistically, that's, that's oh. what it's been so far. Maybe it'll change. Maybe in a post-Putin era, it'll be different. But so far, it's been Russia exporting goods to, to these small countries. And how can it be otherwise when you have a so-called economic union that is totally dominated, not only in size, but in power by one member? Russia question. Who is more underrated Prime Minister of Russia, Stalipin or Gaidar? <laughs> uh, that's a hard question. I, I, I would say Stalipin. He's more underrated. Ah, more underrated. I, I mean, like... What the, do the, you the, think? Uh, I think it's Gaidar. That's an interesting... I, I can see your point. It's a clever... And it's, a, it's an important insight. Bravo. Okay. Interesting. So, so you are with me? Yeah, I think okay. I would right. give you, yeah. Because, I mean, Stalipin was killed, but Gaidar wasn't, but it doesn't mean... Yeah. I mean, or he was, I don't know. Um, so, let me finish with a very, very dismal question. Not, not nice. Uh, Harper's Magazine, you probably know about it. They wrote about a you being apologist to Central Asian regimes. And I want to ask you, like, a personal question about this. Is you basically devote very big chunk of your life in terms of studying this region and very sincerely you did research like you went to Turkmenistan for example and, and so on and so forth and I understand that in Central Asia you have to play by certain rules like you can't really go to a pl you can't really research Turkmenistan with being a constant critic of the, of the regime and so on you have to do research uh, and then I, I feel like n nor in Central Asia nor in the US if you do stuff like that people will kind of appreciate you meaning how can I say, Central Asians still, I think, think you're like American, uh, you know, diplomat or, or, you know, you worked in the administration or maybe there's something about you that... Never been employed by the government. Yeah, yeah, but, but, but you know, like, y the centers are, uh, that you started is part of the government, right? No, it's part of, no, absolutely not. No, okay. No, no, I mean the, the, the one that... The, the Kennan Soviet. Institute. Yeah. No, it's okay. not governmental. It's, 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 it's part of the Wilson Center, which oh, has okay. its own board of trustees. It's a national memorial. It's like okay. the Washington Monument. Yeah. What, what I'm trying to say is, like, in Central Asia, if, if you will make a case that, oh, I never was a part of the federal government, nobody's going to say, oh, that must be right. They, you, they will still think that you are kind of... So you're... So, so you're in the, like, and, and neither here, like, if you say, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, a puppet of regimes in Central Asia. Nobody will say, no, like, people are pretty critical about what you write, right? So yeah. how do you reconcile it, like, being, Look, be, being, be, being, you know, it, not really sympathizing both parts of the world? What, what is a serious disease today that people are concerned about? Cancer. Cancer. Okay. I'm not, don't mean to imply yeah. a comparison here, but if I'm a scientists studying cancer it doesn't mean I'm in love with cancer I or that I'm somehow a <laughs> affiliate of cancer uh, to I want to under my objective in Central Asia is not political at all I could care less it is to understand and to understand you have to have face-to-face -face contact you have to you you have to understand and that does imply that does imply explaining in the West and in the East, by the way. These are equally valid in Japan, China, you know. Uh, it often implies explaining to skeptics who, who, who just say, oh, this is all bad, that there's something there that you aren't grasping. How do you live with this? Like, my question was more, again, personal, meaning neither here nor there they fully believe your intentions. Like, I understand you as probably as a scholar, 
But like most of the people, I'm sure in, 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 in government buildings in Central Asia or in, 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 in Caspian, they were still thinking about you as, as an American person, meaning American as, as being from the government. Well, I think it, it, what you're saying, I've never thought of it this way, I have okay. to tell you. But uh, I would say this is a, 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 an amazing sign of success if you're being criticized from both sides. Okay. Because simultaneously, you know, for 25 years, we've found immense support here for what we're doing in Central Asia. And for 25 years, I've formed deep friendships uh, all over Central Asia, and, 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 and I think these are entirely compatible. Okay, uh, final question. 100 years from now, if historians want to write a book about you, what do you want to be remembered for? And the second question is, what do you think you will be remembered for? Well, first, no one is really remembered. Let's no, meaning like as an author, as, a, as, a, as an yeah. intellectual. Do you think they will think, oh, Fred Starr, the jazz historian, or they will say Fred Starr, the Central Asian historian? Like, what do you think that gets you I think awake? in different places, in different times, people but might overall. be, I, I don't think they'll like be a, a Google single. search. Like yeah. a Google search will come up with, oh, with a musician or well, with, a, with a Central Asian. Like, yeah. just, just guess. I mean, I'm not saying like you have to predict the future. I really, I have no idea. So, okay, what do you I, want I to be remembered I, for then? Like, I, what do you want to be remembered for? I think that I have been very fortunate to have been able to pursue my interests in a lot of different areas that actually are much more related to one another than may at first appear. And, uh, and that this is what a free person I was fortunate to live in a very favorable environment and to make good use of it in several different areas. And whether it's me or someone else, that's an important message. All right. Thanks uh, for being here. Thanks for your uh, time. Uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, I thank you. This has been fascinating and a lot of fun, too. All right. Thanks. <laughs>